Okay, well, you probably some of you folks wondered why we would take um, a topic and put it in three separate uh, webcasts, webinars. Um, partly that's my doing because I am old enough to know that confined spaces is extremely important, uh, extremely hazardous. And anyone who is going to have a confined space task ahead of them should follow the rules, the safe work practices. Um, I, I've just been involved with investigations of injuries, uh, illnesses, and then deaths of people who didn't pay heed to the rules. So confined spaces, last week, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about what they were, kind of an overview today. I want to talk more about what a confined space, the, the permit, a confined space permit. Now, number one, how do we identify a confined space? We've talked about this last time, but it, it's, it's important to know. Do you have one? And then the basic principles of confined spaces, the hazards and hazardous atmospheres, and then how to control or eliminate the hazards. Now, you need to know this if you're an employer. You need to in, inform all your employees, even if they're not going to go into the confined space, you need to tell them this is a confined space. And if you go in there, you must do the following and whatever you've laid out in your policies. Now, that's important because if you haven't told someone about this and they get into that confined space and they get hurt or there's a fatality and you didn't do that, you're responsible. Even if they did something dumb, like crawling into something they shouldn't have been in, if you didn't tell them, don't do that, then, you know, you'll be ha uh, the, the one liable. <clears throat> you know, if you go to Lowe's um, today and you buy a stepladder, there's um, 47 labels on that stepladder telling you what not to do, telling you about all the hazards that you can fall off and hit your head. I'm being a little facetious, but you need to tell people this is a confined space. Do not enter. Do not enter without a permit. Yada yada. It's important, or you'll be the one to pay the to pay the cost. Now, workers' comp. You know you're going to be taking care of that. However, you don't want to be sued for negligence or undue liabilities. So make sure you mark and and tell your employees, even aside from a sign in your regular training sessions, tell them what confined spaces are, identify them around the plant. Uh, you can do this in a, uh, a short lunchbox talk kind of a thing. But make sure that every employee, including the ones up in the front office, unless they never go out into the plant, but anybody that could possibly go out in the plant should take this little training session and sign off on it. Now, I, I say this to you only because I don't want you getting in trouble at a later date. So make sure you do that. Inform people where they are. And then you should tell them what it is. And we mentioned this in the last session. Number one, it's large enough to get a, a, a whole person inside it. It can be anything from a, a small closet to as big as the Astrodome. Uh, if it's not designed for human occupation. So large enough to get into, not designed for human uh, human occupation, and then has limited or restricted entrance or exit. Uh, things like tunnels, manholes, sewers, uh, silos, grain storage bins, ship holes. Now, it must have all, ca all three of those characteristics to be considered a confined space. And then what is a limited restricted entry or exit? What does that mean? It means can I get in and out of this confined space easily? I.e., is the opening big enough? 
are there impediments in the opening? Or am I going to be uh, inside, for instance, I can go in this uh, confined space 30 feet, and at 15 feet, there could be a gas line that could expose, that could explode. Am I going to be on the opposite side so the entrance is blocked? You know, there could be any kind of impediment to, to block my exit, and, and that's considered restricted entry or exit. Uh, a manhole, a small door, a ladder is an impediment, a long tunnel is an impediment. Uh, in most cases, trenches are not considered confined spaces. However, they can be. And that would be up to the job supervisor whether he wanted to include that in a confined space or not. That is an employer call. And it's an employer choice. Now, <clears throat> in the bottom of the uh, PowerPoint, you see two pictures. One is a man, uh, 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 some form of a silo, I guess. And it shows a small opening to get in and out. To the left of that is a open box, more or less, with a big open end. Uh, that probably would not be considered a confined space. Even though it's deep, it's still easily uh, exited. Now, you will notice, though, that there is an airline even going into that trailer body uh, because they, it could be extra hot or it could be bad fumes. It looks like it may be being painted, which could be a problem. So, you know, you you might have a confined space that doesn't require a permit, like the one on the left, um, or you might have a confined space that requires a permit, like the one on the right. In either case, you need to make sure your employees have the right equipment and gear to keep them safe. And then the basic principles of confined spaces, number one, they can be deadly. And probably the reason I'm so um, adamant about confined spaces is, you know, I've helped move the dead bodies. And that is not fun. And if your company has a death in a confined space, then, you, you know, the cost is way more than money. The cost is emotional, and uh, it just goes on for a long time. So confined spaces can be deadly. Some confined spaces are more hazardous than others, i.e. the picture on the previous page. Confined space conditions can change rapidly from no hazards to life-threatening hazards. For instance, uh, you, know, you, you might have uh, an area that you've been working in and for whatever reason, uh, a gas line ruptures or a, a oxyacetylene hose ha develops a leak, and all of a sudden that area is contaminated with toxic fumes. And then the next one is some confined spaces are so hazardous, and again, we refer to the pictures on the previous page, that they require a written permit to go into them. Now, it's a written permit, and um, you should you, every company should have a permit that they fill out, and you post it at the entrance to the confined space. And then, of course, you need to have a copy in the office or with the supervisor or wherever. But that permit is going to contain some basic information. You know, where is it? Uh, why is it hazardous? who's the person going into that confined space, and then it names who the watcher or watchers are going to be. That's people posted on the outside to make sure the person working uh, is still OK. Um, and then the permit is going to contain your notations on checking the gas area, the, the gas uh, in, in the confined space. And, you know, I recommend a gas monitor That'll do at least three or maybe four different gases. Uh, hydrogen sulfide, CO2, and CO are the key ones. And then, you know, I like to have one that measures the amount of oxygen so you know there's enough oxygen in there. And those will read out for you, and you put them on the permit. Um, and we'll see later on how you measure that and uh, how you get a good reading inside the permit, inside the confined space. And 
then um, sometimes the hazards can be controlled or eliminated before entering. You can purge it, you can air, air it all out, um, or you can have the person wear proper gear. And then the next page is the main hazards that we deal with is hazardous atmosphere. I keep that as number one because that is the key thing, hazardous atmospheres. An atmosphere can be good and an hour later turn sour. And then you've got engulfing materials. This would be inside a green elevator, for instance, a green silo, um, inside cement, um, uh, either wet or dry cement. And then you have the entrapment. That's where something blocks your exit. Uh, moving parts. Um, you're, you're in an area and you can't get away from a piece of machinery that's coming in or moving. And then uh, electricity. Uh, electrical uh, electrical uh, hazards that can be much worse inside a confined space. And then when is it too dangerous that a written entry is required? Well, number one, if there is an actual or potential hazardous atmosphere. It doesn't matter whether it's a trench, which typically isn't confined spaces, or a, a truck body or a tanker or a silo, is there a chance of a hazardous atmosphere? Or when the space contains loose material, I, again, a trench can cave in, or a silo, or grain, or cement, uh, if the space is configured to trap a person, or if there's any other recognized serious safety and health hazard, then you must use a written permit system, confined space permit. Hazard and atmospheres, um, they generally will have one or more of the following characteristics. The atmosphere is a flammable gas, a mist, or a vapor. It's a flammable dust. Uh, for instance, in a, in a grain silo, the dust from the grain is extremely, extremely hazardous. Uh, recently, OSHA has really had a target on combustible dust. Now, in a plant, combustible dust can be an issue. In a confined space, it's really an issue. And so, even a light switch, you could be down in a small room in a sub-basement, and a lot of uh, com, com, what we call combustible dust hit the light switch, and the little spark that takes place inside the receptacle can ignite the dust. Um, you know, if you, you think of a bag of cement, Portland cement, gray cement. I could put that on a metal bench and I could put every bit of heat to it, take a torch. I could not ignite that cement. It would just turn black. If I took that cement dust and I put it into an HVAC system and I pumped fine particles of dust inside a room or facility, that would be combustible. It won't burn, but it can be combustible. And then the other area of hazardous atmosphere is if the oxygen content goes below 19.5% or above 23.5%. Either, I mean, you have to have between the, you've got a 4% 4, 4 change in oxygen levels to consider it unsafe below 19 and a half or above 23 and a half. Now below 19 and a half, you'll start to get unconscious, you'll start to get dizzy. There's a lot of things that will happen. We'll go over that in a minute. Above 23 and a half, the atmosphere becomes too combustible. If I add oxygen to anything, for instance, uh, an oxyacetylene torch, the acetylene burns at 900 degrees. I add oxygen. It burns at 4,000 degrees. That ratio is the same. If I were to, if I were to take pure oxygen and and spray up, you know, out of a hose onto my shirt, my shirt would be four or five times more combustible. The atmosphere is the same. The atmosphere becomes combustible with too much oxygen, and then air contaminant concentrations that could cause death and incapacitation 
of permanent health problems. In this area, I often think, and it's number one on this, is, um, is uh, nitrogen. Nitrogen is used all the time for purging um, and cleaning tanks, for instance, that have been flammable fluids. And nitrogen is used to purge them out. The problem is with nitrogen is you can't breathe it. Now, in our air, in your room, wherever you are right now, you probably have 21, 22% oxygen and almost the balance of it, 77% of it, is going to be nitrogen. So nitrogen is inert. It won't kill you, won't hurt you. But if you don't have enough oxygen and you got too much nitrogen, it does fix the age. It's just simple as that. Even though it's not a harmful gas, it's an asphyxiating gas. And so you must always do the air monitoring. Every company should have gas monitors on hand to check any confined space every time they go into it. And, um, and, you, know, and you must record it every time you go into it. And then uh, hazardous atmospheres that are uh, flammable gases, vapors, or dusts, um, we will, every product we use will list on the MSDS the lower flammable limit, the LFL. And if the vapor or dust is above a certain amount, you need to have respiratory equipment, fire protection, and a confined space permit. Now, in this case, what makes it above a limit is, let's say the gas vapor lim limits are set at a certain point. I'm just going to set a number. All right, 50 is the point at which they're considered hazardous. If you have in that confined space 10% of that 50, if your reading is 5, then you need, to, you need to have it as a written permit system, and you need to provide respiratory protection or some form of ventilation to get it below that 10%. So it's 10% of the lower flammable limit. So the lower flammable limit, as I said, was, well, I said it was 500 degrees. And below that, you, you, you can't have above 50. So you've got to make sure that you know what you're talking about on the MSDS. Now, LEL is uh, the lower explosive limit. And sometimes you'll see LEL or LFL. Um, now, next chart here gives us an illustration. Um, you got 100% air and no methane. You're fine. Uh, the LFL is 5.3% of methane. 5.3% of methane is the is all you can have. Uh, Anything, anything below that is going to be okay, but you got to go up between 5.3, and then the upper limit is 15%. So you've got to make sure that you have your atmosphere in the limitations. And it's hard to explain it on a chart in a PowerPoint. I, I would rather have the um, the gas monitor and show you how it works. Uh, one of the things we do in a class is uh, I'll have a a 10-gallon uh, drum that I'll put some gas in, and I will drop the um, I will drop the gas monitor down in that drum, and um, take a reading, and people can see that the limit and see how it reads out, and we can change it. We'll put in uh, different gases or, or pull out the oxygen and put in nitrogen, do a lot of things. But in a PowerPoint, it's hard to explain it. But again, we're back to uh, oxygen deficiency, uh, for instance, you have an area, I will use this on a ship because I've been on ships a lot, and you know, you got areas in these old steamers and tramp steamers, they call them, that are all rusted out down inside the ship. The inside walls are rusted. So you can go in there, probably not going to hurt you, except that Rusting is an oxidation process. Rusting takes oxygen. And so if you get an area that's closed off and a lot of rusting has taken place, it has used up the oxygen. 
And if you walk down in there, you're going to collapse immediately because there's no oxygen. A lack of oxygen can cause you to collapse immediately. Uh, it could be a root cellar. Let's say I had a root cellar, and there was a lot of vegetation in that root cellar. And the vegetation grows up, as it grows, it uses oxygen and puts off carbon dioxide. Once the oxygen is gone, the stuff will die. But you're going to, if you step down in there, there's no oxygen. So again, we sometimes don't realize that some of the simplest things can cause us asphyxiation and can make things oxygen deficient. And then some examples of flammable gas levels. Um, if you have um, between 19 and a half and 16 percent oxygen, you'll feel fatigue, mild impaired coordination. For instance, if you're not used to it and you go out to Vail and you go up to 10,000 feet, you don't have nearly the energy level as you do at 500 feet because it's less oxygen and you notice it. Uh, 16 to 12 percent, you'll breathe. Your breathing rate will increase. Your pulse will increase. Your in coordination will really be impaired, and your perception and judgment will not be good. And then uh, 12 to 10 percent, you, you breathe even faster. You develop blue lips and mental confusion. My wife likes to say I'm in that 10 percent range uh, all the time. Uh, and then you go to 10 to 8 percent fainting, nausea, vomiting, and um, uh, between 8 and 6, you actually will die between 6 and 8 minutes. So you really can't lose a lot of oxygen. And then 6% uh, down, uh, in 40 seconds you'll be in a coma and then you'll be dead. So, you know, I, I like to relate. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to watch the old black and white cowboy movies. You know, the Lone Ranger and Tonto, and Tonto would be stuck in a mine, and it would blow up, and they would lose an oxygen, and he'd say, come on, come on. I'm about, I'm about to collapse. It doesn't happen that way. You lose oxygen, the oxygen's gone, you're gone. It happens immediately. So be careful when you send people down into confined spaces. And then hazardous atmospheres, we mentioned um, oxygen-rich atmosphere. It, it's like if you have an oxygen cylinder and it leaks or puts out excess oxygen and you're down there cutting or you're down there brazing or arc welding or whatever you're doing, you could be in serious problem because you've got extra oxygen and then you've now got heat or a flame, and you could develop a really, really bad explosion. Um, we have to be careful, too. I, <clears throat> I was in a mine here in Virginia a number of years ago. Uh, it, was, it was a gypsum mine, you know, the, the sheetrock. Uh, and when you go down the gypsum mine, they're totally white. There's big, big caverns, uh, all white. I mean, it just looks it's almost surreal. But I was down there doing some training on oxyacetylene safety. And we're showing them how to cut and do all the various things. And when you're cutting, sparks fly. And sparks were flying off. And I would hear this noise. It was like a whoomp. And then a, a metal metallic clunk. And I looked around, couldn't see anything. And I cut again. And I heard that same wolf and a metallic clunk. So I thought, well, I better check this out. I had about 10, 12 guys who were in that area working, you know, and, and they were gathered around for this safety talk. Went over to the oxygen acetylene tanks, and I smelled a little acetylene. Come to find out, the acetylene cylinder was leaking but it was leaking right under the bottom of it. And if you notice, the bottom of the cylinder is a concave. And the gas would build up a little bit under that cylinder. And then I was cutting, make a spark, the spark would not be acetylene, and it was lifting the cylinder up off the cart an inch or so and then popping it back down. Now, the reason I tell you that is 
there were 12 guys working in maintenance. They, would, they had been hearing this for two or three days. Nobody did anything about it. They just figured, eh, no, they weren't in an actual confined space. It was a huge cavern, but it was several hundred feet under the ground. And I was not real happy to be down there with a leaking cylinder, nor were they when they found out what it was. And uh, so, you know, you need to be careful with equipment. Make sure nothing is leaking. Uh, when you go into an area with a, uh, if you're welding, you go in with a, a tank of uh, nitrogen or a tank of argon, which again is not explosive. But as you do the welding, you're pushing nitrogen or argon or helium into that confined space, using up and displacing the oxygen. And then your man could actually collapse. So be cautious that you don't have things oxygen rich or oxygen deficient. And then toxic chemicals. Uh, at high levels, most chemicals can be immediately, immediately life threatening, or they can cause permanent bodily harm. At lower levels, they can be an irritation. They can give you emphysema. They can they can uh, give you uh, allergies. It can cause irritation in your nasal passages, in your throat. And then most chemicals have a PEL, a permissible exposure limit, which uh, will cause harm if they're exceeded. And you need to know what those limits are and have a gas monitor to check inside that confined space. Now, this would be an area where you might need to have a gas monitor that checks other things, like you can have it check almost any limit, almost any chemical you want it to check. And then non-toxic or low-toxic chemicals can reduce oxygen. I've already mentioned that. And then the most common toxic chemicals in confined spaces are hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide. The hydrogen sulfide is nasty smelling, you know it's there. Carbon monoxide, it's invisible, it's tasteless, there's not any color to it, and all, it's just very quick acting. You just, you, you get it and you die. So carbon monoxide, and that's the one area you always want to have on your gas monitor. Oxygen levels, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide, and then, you know, you can have any other series of choices, but um, carbon monoxide is the deadliest thing. And then also remember that every chemical that there is practically uh, can be filtered out with some form of respiratory equipment, except for carbon monoxide. There is no filter for carbon monoxide, none, period. And, um, you know, you can wear respiratory equipment for a lot of things, but not carbon monoxide. That would take a an air supplied sealed system. Otherwise, you you would you would have a fatality on your hands. And then other toxic chemicals include welding fumes, vapors from liquid liquid residues in storage tanks, or chemical products used in the confined space. Uh, I had a question come in from one of the um, classes I did recently. Um, a man wanted to know what to wear. He, he was very, very allergic, had a bad reaction to chlorine and ammonia. Now, he was very quick to tell me he didn't use them together. But it was a home use. It was bathroom, cleaning his bathroom. And uh, I was able to give him a respirator that he could wear, a, a face mask. But carbon monoxide, there is none. And then chemicals can quickly reach toxic levels in the air of a confined space, especially gases, solvent vapors, or sprayed products. So you need to be constantly checking. Now, you can take a gas monitor and put it down into a confined space and check it at three levels, for instance, the, the very bottom, the middle, and high up, and get a reading. You put it on a long hose and drop it down in before you enter. Now, advisable if anything has even got a hint of uh, hazardous materials entering, 
and the operator, the man working, should wear that monitor. And he wears it on his belt or on his uh, chest, and it'll beep. It'll give him an audible warning if the levels reach a certain point. That's very important. Now, hazardous atmospheres, we talked about hydrogen sulfide. It's, uh, it's commonly found in sewers. And it can be it can go to higher levels instantly. Um, when you're working on, in city water treatment plants or sewage treatment plants, just disturbing the sewage can release more hydrogen sulfide gas. And then you can see the symptoms on the chart below in parts per million. It goes anywhere from a strong odor, which is not pleasant, all the way back to death within minutes. Now, we're talking parts per million. And you can see that a thousand parts per million is instant collapse. Now think of what a thousand parts per million is. That's one one thousandth if we put that into fractions. That isn't very much. And um, 200 parts per million will give you coughing and red eyes. 600 will make you unconscious. So you've got to know that some things are extremely, extremely hazardous. And then, uh, again, the carbon monoxide uh, comes from operating internal combustion engines in or near a confined space. Um, just because you're using propane-powered forklifts or, or a generator does not mean it doesn't emit carbon monoxide. It's reduced, but it still, still uh, emits it. And then engulfing materials. Engulfing materials include liquids, loose solids, grain, other granular material. You cannot escape when you get caught. You think, why don't you just climb out? It doesn't work that way. And then uh, moving loose solids will usually suffocate you. And then workers will get engulfed in when in-feed or out-feed lines are inadvertently opened or activated. Yeah, this, this is particularly caught, uh, particularly in things like grain silos or storage silos. And then injuring grain bins can be hazardous. And uh, grain bins aren't, aren't designed for humans to occupy. They have limited entries, limited access, and uh, makes it difficult to escape. And when you go into some of these areas, you must have a rescue harness on at all times. I recommend in many confined spaces rescue harnesses even if it's not engulfing materials, but it may, it may be some form of toxic gas, that a rescuer can't go down in and get you, which means someone's got to pull you out. So if you have a harness on, they can pull you out. So harness material is important. Now next week, we'll be done. two weeks from now, we'll be talking about rescue and retrieve and what's required. So we'll, we'll get into that. But entrapment hazards, is when a space is configured in a way to trap a worker. You can see here that someone gets into this. Um, it, 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 you just can't. It's a sloping walls, things that slope in, um, inside tanker trucks, uh, whatever you do, it, it, it can be an entrapment. And then other confined space hazards, uh, electric lines, steam lines, hydraulic lines. Hydraulic lines are typically hot fluid, and they're typically under pressure. And they they can be flammable at times. Stop and think of a hydraulic line bursting in a confined space when one of your employees is in there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, hazards caused by welding or painting and mechanical hazards from moving parts. <clears throat> they can be controlled. The hazards can be controlled by preventing entry, number one, reducing the hazards before the person enters. If the hazard can't be controlled, use a written permit system to enter safely. And by the way, you must keep the written confined space entry permits on file for three years. Keep them so that if OSHA comes in to inspect, they can see that you do, you do this, you do it regularly, and you keep a record of it. So you must keep the confined space permits on file. Now you can do it on the computer. Once you once you 
you've done posting it, you can then um, you can then uh, uh, scan it into your computer and keep it that way. Uh, warn employees and control access. Again, as I mentioned, post warning signs. Make sure people know they can't go in there. Limit employee access by putting a barrier and a lock on it. Have a closed door. Put yellow tape. Uh, make sure that un unauthorized workers never, okay, never enter that confined space. And then control controlling hazardous atmospheres. Uh, always drain or pump out liquid contents. Blank off all infeeding lines, and then test the air and ventilate. Dangerous atmosphere, uh, and you can see here if this is a a tank, and uh, you can see how the, the person is testing. The man on the left is dropping a monitor down in. He stops it at the top, tests the atmosphere at the top. He puts it at the middle, and he puts it at the bottom. You need to check all levels. Because you could tech, check it down three feet, and that person goes down ten. Or you could go down ten, and that person slowly comes up a ladder and collapses at the top of the ladder. So you must know that things can exist in pockets or layers, not necessarily uniformly distributed. And then to eliminate hazards, lockout, tag out policies must be in place. Always lock out, tag out electrical, steam pipes, infeeding pipes, uh, everything that can can keep that can surprise a person. You know, hydraulic pressure, uh, steam pressure, air pressure, pneumatic pressure, all those things. And then, if they can't be eliminated, you must have a written permit system or find another way to do the job. Any questions? I've been talking forever here. And I uh, hope that you've got the message that confined spaces are not for kids. I'm all set, Craig.